Good evening. Today is July 27th, and this is Kingdom News. My name is Russell Saroop, and here are the headlines for today. Pakistani Christian family beaten for saving 13-year-old daughter from kidnapping by Muslim extremists. Protests turn violent nationwide as White House ponders deploying more federal agents. Israeli scientists identify drug they hope can downgrade COVID-19 to common coal level. A Pakistani Christian girl was nearly abducted from her home earlier this month when a radical group of Muslim men attacked her entire family, according to a US-based Christian persecution watchdog. International Christian Concern reported the near abduction of the 13-year-old daughter of Aslam Messi and Noreen Bibi in the Christian-majority neighborhood of Sadigabad in Pakistan, Punjab province on July 12th. Messi and his family were violently attacked by a mob of 12 men who broke into their home and tried to kidnap his daughter. Noor who they planned to rape and forcefully convert to Islam. According to Bibi, her husband was injured in the attack and hasn't received medical care to his wounds. Police have not registered the case against Irfan and medical staff have not provided medical aid to the injured, Bibi was quoted saying. Irfan's threats have also continued despite the family's resistance. Bibi also said that Irfan supporters have threatened to burn down their home and cause further harm in the family as the family pursues legal action. Despite the immense number of crimes committed against Christians in Pakistan, those facing persecution rarely see justice in the legal system. According to ICC Advocacy Director Matthias Pertola, the United States Department has designated Pakistan as a country of particular concern for engaging in and tolerating egregious and systematic abuses of religious freedom. Pakistan has also been ranked as fifth worst country in the world when it comes to Christian persecution on Open Doors USA's 2020 World Watch List. A member of China's Early Reign Covenant Church says the Chinese Communist Party continues to persecute members of the church by threatening to send their children to government re-education camps or forcibly remove adopted children from parents. They not only threatened us, normal adult, normal church members, but they threatened our children, Kiang said. Some of our members have adopted children and CPC forcibly sent the adoptive children back to the original family. That is the main reason why we fled China, because we can't guarantee our adopted child would not be taken away from them. Communist officials removed four adopted children from one ERCC family, returned them to their biological parents, and eventually dispersed them among other homes, Kiang said. This is a living tragedy, Kiang said. Their constant oppression made me feel we must flee China because our children are important to us. On Thursday, save the persecuted Christians a leading international human rights advocacy group delivered an open letter to the United States Attorney General, William Barr, asking him to designate the CCP as a transnational criminal organization, which the FBI def defines as posing a significant and growing threat to national and international security with dire implications for public safety, public health, democratic institu institutions, and economic stability across the globe. Open Doors USA ranked China at number 23 on its 2020 World Watch list of the 50 most dangerous countries for Christians. The Supreme Court has rejected the plea of a Nevada congregation to suspend state-imposed restrictions 
on in-person gatherings that only apply to faith communities and not secular entities. In a five to four decision, Chief Justice John Roberts joined liberal justices to deny an appeal of Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley in Lyon County, whose plea had been rejected by lower courts according to the Wall Street Journal. The church argued that Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak's public health orders gave casinos and other secular businesses greater leeway than houses of worship, which are prohibited from conducting in-person worship services with more than 50 people. Calvary Chapel wanted to hold services for up to 90 members, which is 50% capacity, while fully complying with social distancing rules and other required measures. The judges made no comment while rejecting the appeal. The Associated Press had earlier reported that 96% of the approximately 14,000 cases in Nevada at the time were concentrated around Las Vegas and Reno. Lyon County, where the church is located, only had 24 active cases. Of Nevada's 41,993 reported COVID-19 cases, 35,786 are concentrated around Las Vegas and 4,724 are around Reno. Lyon County, where the church is located, has 169 reported cases as of Sunday morning. Calvary Chapel was represented by the Alliance Defending Freedom a conservative law firm that frequently handles religious liberty litigation. An appeal argued that Sisolak has been inconsistent in his enforcement of the restrictions, noting that the governor openly supported recent large-scale protests. When hundreds of protesters gathered in packed throngs in blatant violation of the directive ban on gatherings over 50, the governor and Attorney General tweeted their support. They, they suit added, they took no action to impose the directive or enforce social distancing rules. Calvary Chapel supports protesters' right to free speech. It just wants to live by the same rules. More than 100 Christian pastors and pro-life academics and advocates have called on the Democratic National Committee to recognize the inviolable human dignity of the child before and after birth and adopt a party platform that's friendlier to those who are pro-life. Some of us are registered Democrats and some of us are not but we appreciate the Democratic Party's stated commitment to human rights, equality, and fairness, they wrote in a letter to the Democratic Platform Committee, organized by the pro-life group Democrats for Life. According to, accordingly, we urge the Democratic Party to embrace policies that protect both women and children, legal protection for pre-born children, improved prenatal care for women in need, especially women of color, alternatives to abortion, and a comprehensive culture of life free from violence, poverty, and racism, the letter adds. The letter notes that the United States, in just one of seven countries alongside North Korea, to allow the horrific practice of elective late-term abortion after 20 weeks. Democrats for Life Executive Director Kristen Day said at the time that in her 18 year career, she has not seen such extremism in the Democratic Party on abortion. Since 2010, she warned the Democrats that they would lose their political advantages in Southern states, including Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana that had all flipped from blue to red. The Democratic Party, she added, had moved away from safe, legal, and rare abortion to supporting abortion up to nine months for any reason. <clears throat> An outbreak of the new coronavirus swept through Michigan convent like wildfire, killing 13 of religious sisters who lived, prayed, and worked together in a matter of weeks, 
a Global Sisters report said on Monday. I get chills thinking about that. Mary Andrew Budinsky, the superior of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary Convent in Livonia, where the women live communally, said in the report, the raw grief is yet to come, I think. Between Good Friday on April 10th and May 10th, 12 of the sisters died after battling the coronavirus. Then on June 27th, one of the 18 other sisters who initially survived the illness died from its effects to become the 13th fatality. Obituaries provided by Susan English, Executive Director for Mission Advancement for Sisters to the New York Times, show that the women were all members of the Felician Congregation for at least 50 years and ranged in age from 69 to 99. As the number of deaths from COVID-19 rises, the debate over the effectiveness of an anti-malaria drug, hydroxychloroquine, has also persisted. In an opt published by Newsweek, Yale epidemiology professor, Dr. Harvey Risch wrote that hydro, hydroxychloroquine is highly effective especially when given in combination with the antibiotics, zitromycin or doxycycline, and the natural supplement of zinc. Risch said the drug works against the virus when taken early before it multiplies throughout the body. He said some physicians who prescribe hydroxychloroquine to patients are now being scrutinized for their actions. Physicians who have been using these medications in the face of widespread skepticism have been truly heroic, he wrote. They have done what the science shows in their best interest of their patients, often a great personal risk. I myself know of two doctors who have saved the lives of hundreds of patients with these medications, but are now fighting state medical boards to save their licenses and reputations. The cases against them are completely without scientific merit, Risch said. Hydroxychloroquine was praised by President Trump early on in the pandemic, despite warnings from some public health officials that the drug's effectiveness against COVID-19 was questionable. Previously reported that a new study revealed the drug was actually helping patients survive COVID-19. In fact, the study from the Henry Ford Health System in Michigan said the drug significantly cut the death rate of patients. Rich pointed out what the FDA doesn't mention is that this side effect occurred when patients used hydro, hydroxychloroquine for long periods of time, often for the treatment of arthritis and lupus. Two months after the killing of George Floyd, an unarmed black man who died in police custody in Minnesota, thousands of people across the country continue to march in support, in support of Black Lives Matter and against police brutality. Early this morning, hundreds of demonstrators continued to stage protests outside the federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon. Police have been deploying tear gas and flashbangs to keep protesters off federal property as the violent confrontation between activists and the law enforcement entered its eighth week. In one park, not far from the protests, they discovered a bag full of loaded rifles, magazine and Molotov cocktails. Jay, a protester in Portland, argued the goal is to have us actually get somewhere with all these protests. You know, people are trying to go for systematic change. Early Sunday, thousands took to the streets of Portland and more than half a dozen other cities around the country. The protests are often turning from peaceful to chaotic and even fatal. On Saturday, a driver was arrested after he allegedly shot and killed a man after driving through a protest in Austin, Texas. 
video captured at the scene shows dozens of people running for cover as multiple gunshots ring out. And in Richmond, Virginia, police used chemical agents after a crowd at attacked officers with rocks, batteries, and other objects. All this comes as the White House threatens to send more federal agents to cities across the country, gripped by weeks of violent protests. Leaders for a Christian ministry in the United Kingdom have said they've received death threats and the bank accounts associated with the organization have been shut down following a mob rule campaign from LGBTQ activists. The ministry in question, Core Issues Trust, is a Christian nonprofit that supports men and women seeking voluntary to change their sexual preferences and gender expressions, according to Fox News. Pro-LGBTQ activists began targeting the faith-based group at the end of June. A coordinated campaign has resulted in our ministry coming under immense pressure and key service providers canceling their services, action which we consider to be discriminatory. CIT executive Mike Davidson said in a statement, Barclays Bank notified CIT earlier this week that it was closing the Christian Ministries account after several other companies like MailChimp and PayPal took action against the group. Facebook and Inter Instagram have also removed CIT's contents from its outlets. Jane Ozan, a gay evangelical leading the effort against CIT, has accused Davidson of being a practicer and promoter of conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is a very complex issue, the officer wrote in a statement. There are a wide range of practices which may fall within its scope, and we want to ensure we have a thorough understanding of the situation in the UK to inform an effective approach. We are not trying to prevent LGBT people from seeking spiritual support from their faith leaders or others in exploration of their sexual orientation. Pastor John MacArthur with Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California says, state mandates restriction, restricting worship services are overreach of government authority. The pastor eloquently argued in a statement Friday that government officials have no right to interfere in ecclesiastical matters in a way that undermines or disregards the God-given authority of pastors and elders. Amid the pandemic, Christians in California have faced multiple challenges to singing and worshiping together. First, the government banned singing in churches to slow down the spread of the coronavirus. And then came the recent order to ban indoor church gatherings, which have put a halt on church services. But Pastor MacArthur points out that it's church's duty to stay open despite recent restrictions by Governor Gavin Newsom. Each has a sphere of authority with jurisdictional limits that must be respected. A father's authority is limited to his own family. Church leaders' authority, which is delegated to them by Christ, is limited to church matters, he said, and government is specifically tasked with the oversight and protection of civic peace and well-being within the boundaries of a nation or a community. God has not granted civic rulers authority over the doctrine practice or polity in the church. He added, the biblical order is clear. Christ is Lord over Caesar, not vice versa. Christ, not Caesar, is head of the church. Conversely, the church does not in any sense rule the state. Again, these are distinct kingdoms and Christ is sovereign over both. British leaders, celebrities, and politicians are boycotting Twitter for two days starting Monday morning to protest a string of anti-Semitic 
tweets from popular UK musical artist Willie. Participants are using the hashtag no safe space for Jew hate to promote the 48 hour social media walkout. Willie, whose real name is Richard Cowie, came under fire Friday when, when he went on an anti-Semitic Twitter tirade accusing Jews of ignoring racism against black people and exploiting them for money. Jewish people don't care what black people went through. They just use us to make money to feed their kids for generations as well, he wrote in one tweet. He also compared the Jewish people to the Ku Klux Klan. There are two sets of people who nobody has really wanted to challenge, Jewish and KKK. But being in business for 20 years, you started to understand why rednecks are the KKK and Jewish people are the law. Work that out, he said. The artist was quickly dropped by his management company. The UK's Metropolitan Police said on Saturday that it is investigating Willie's statements. The Met takes all reports of anti-Semitism extremely seriously. The relevant material is being assessed. After months of COVID-19 related restrictions compelled places of worship to suspend on-campus services across America, more than 70% of Protestant churches have cautiously resumed in-person services following the required safety measures, according to a New Life research survey. About three months ago in April, less than 10% of Protestant churches held in-person services, but the number climbed to more than 55% by the first weekend in June and in July, more than 70% met physically, according to the LifeWay survey. While more and more churches have resumed in-person worship services, it has not always been a straight path back, said LifeWay Research's Executive Director, Scott McConnell. Some have had difficulty resuming or had to stop meeting again as things got worse in their area. The study found that 99% of the churches that have reopened to meet physically indoors are taking health and safety precaution. For example, 94% of pastors said they provided hand sanitizers, masks, or gloves to those needing it. 86% conducted additional cleaning of surfaces and 76% closed seats to increase the distance between people. Nearly 60% of churches meeting in person have recommended masks, but only about 35% required attendees to wear them. And more than 20% of churches that have reopened added services to allow people to spread out more and 18% provided additional viewing rooms to do so. Some churches also conducted temperature checks of staff and volunteers, which is about 21%, and some checked temperatures of all attendees, which is about 14%, the survey found. Resuming in-person worship services has not been reverted, reverting to worship as usual, McConnell com commented. Churches are making efforts to make the environment safe, but these efforts are often second-guessed by those who either want more precautions or less restrictions. In late May, immediately after President Donald Trump declared churches to be essential and said they should be allowed to reopen as long as they adhere to the CDC's health guidelines, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decided in favor of California Governor Gavin Newsom's statewide stay-at-home order and rejected an emergency motion to allow for in-person religious services to proceed in that state. In a society riff with materialism, negativity, and distraction, Bob Guff is one on a mission to help Christians rediscover and live out their God-given dreams and ambitions. We're living in a very difficult period, Guff, 
a New York Times bestseller author and popular Christian speaker, said in an interview with the Christian Post, we're thinking in terms of immediacy of some real urgent matters. While those things are important, it's also a time to say, what are some ambitions I had? The urgency of the things that are happening right now shouldn't extinguish our ambitions. Many Christians have some beautiful, beautiful ambitions, but sometimes we get distracted by our insecurities, by what other people think about our visions, or we're trying to get validation from others. That's not a disqualifier, but I want us to put that under the microscope for a second and say, I wonder why we're looking for the approval of others before we move for forward with something God already said he wanted us to do. The 61-year-old thought leader knows a thing or two about pursuing ambition. A recognized lawyer for over 25 years, he left all that behind to become the Honorable Consul of Uganda. In 2001, he founded Love Does, an international nonprofit that pursues justice for children in high conflict areas such as Uganda, Somalia, Afghanistan, Nepal, and India. In the Christian community, we can sometimes be embarrassed of our ambition, as if it would be selfish to dream big, that we should be denying ourselves the opportunity to do that, Goff said. What I'm saying is, let's spread out all your ambitions on the table. Just look at them and then just ask for each one. How come? Is this an ambition that's going to outlast me? And then do something about it. In his new book, Dream Big, Know What You Want, Why You Want It, and What You're Going to Do About It, Goff draws from personal experience to offer practical, biblically-minded ways Christians can live out their ambitions. According to the popular speaker and author, any ambitions outlined in Matthew 25 or James 1, helping the poor, the sick, widowed, and hungry are beautiful and lasting ambitions, things we'll talk about in heaven. A church volunteer has confessed to setting fire to a medieval cathedral in the French city of Nantes earlier this month, badly damaging the Gothic worship space. The unnamed 39-year-old Rwanda man had previously been detained and questioned by authorities and then was again detained for further questioning when he confessed. He confessed to an to the allegations against him, which, as the prosecutor indicated, are causing destruction and damage by fire, said his lawyer, Quentin Chabot, as reported by the Associated Press. He regrets the facts. That is certain. He is in a sort of repentance. The volunteer had been tasked with locking up the cathedral and had set three fires. Two to two organs and one to an electrical box. The motive remains unknown, according to AP. Officially known as the Saint Pierre at Saint Paul Cathedral, the Nantes Sanctuary was the subject of an arson attack on July 18th that damaged an organ and stained glass windows. It took around 100 firefighters about three hours to contain the fire which did not spread to the roof in large because a fire in 1972 led the church to replace it with concrete. The Nantes Cathedral traces its history back to the 15th century and is considered a major national treasure, second only to the famed Notre Dame Cathedral of Paris. After Notre Dame, St. Pierre at St. Paul Cathedral in the heart of Nantes is in flames, French President Emmanuel Macron wrote on Twitter at the time, supporting for our firefight support for our firefighters who take all the risks to save the Gothic jewel of the city of the Dukes. In April of last year, the Notre Dame 
Cathedral in Paris suffered a major accidental fire during restoration work that caused severe damage to the structure. When MLD players knelt to honor the Black Lives Matter movement ahead of the season opener, San Francisco Giants pitcher Sam Coonrod was the only player who remained standing, later explaining that as a Christian, he doesn't kneel before anything besides God. At the opening day game Thursday between the Giants and Los Angeles Dodgers at the Dodgers Stadium, all the players except the 27-year-old relief pitcher kneeled as they held a long black ribbon provided by Major League Baseball organization. I'm a Christian, so I just believe that I can't kneel before anything besides God, Coonrod said, according to TMZ Sports. The pitcher explained the gesture meant no ill will. I don't think I'm better than anybody. I'm just a Christian. I feel if I did kneel, I'd be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite, he said, according to San Francisco Chronicle. I just can't get on board with a couple of things. I've read about Black Lives Matter, how they, le how they lean toward Marxism, and they said some negative things about the nuclear family. I just can't get on board with that, he quoted as saying, I'm not mad at someone who decided to kneel. I just don't think it's too much to ask that I just get the same respect, he further explained. Giants team manager Gabe Kapler said he respected Coonrod's decision. We were going to give them the choice on whether they were going to stand, kneel, or do something else. That was a personal decision for Sam, Kapler said. Sports Illustrated writer Dan Gotland, however, criticized Coonrod in an open saying, if a central tenet of Christianity is treating others with love and respect, it's not clear how not joining a call for just would be hypocritical. A youth pastor from Chicago has taken dual guardianship over several young men from some of the city's most undeserved neighborhoods and has allowed them to live in the suburbs where they are now offered improved education, discipleship, and resources. Pastor Terrence Wallace, founder of the InZone Project, helps oversee seven young men living in a suburban home in Wakanda, Illinois, and has brought them into his family in a literal sense. He plans to move over 20 others from the city into a suburban mansion in the affluent Barrington Hills this fall. Wallace's structure of removing youth living in undeserved areas to another area with more opportunities first came to be in 2011 when he initially launched the InZone project in New Zealand. My kids in New Zealand had to come home and write essays on Chicago violence and gangs. Wallace, a Chicago native, told the Christian Post. Those essays were largely about black people, men in particular in Chicago. When I came back to Chicago, I couldn't look at what was happening and do nothing. Wallace and his family of Angie Mooney, a state education worker, have lived with seven young black men from undeserved Chicago communities in Wakanda for over a year. Schools, homes, and opportunities are much better in Wakanda compared to the city, Mooney told CP. The end zone project typically begins with a young person reaching out to the program who is interested in joining Wallace's family. Parents and legal guardians are constantly involved, according to Wallace. New applicants can apply online for the program, and after an interview with the youth and their parents, Wallace begins the process of bringing them into the family. The family currently resides in a large suburban home located on a street of 100% white residents. Because of the stereotypes and negative connotations around black and brown kids, there's resistance from municipalities but not so much in the community, Wallace said. 
But once people get around the kids and get to know them, the stereotypes always fade away. Youth who take part in the program are offered daily devotions and attend local schools. In Wakanda and the soon to come location in the Barrington Hills, the local schools offer up opportunities that are not present in their neighborhood. Nearly two thirds of Americans say they agree with President Trump's temporary suspension of new immigrant visas which the White House says is necessary to ensure U.S. workers are protected as they search for jobs during the U.S. economy recovery from the pandemic. A total of 65% of United States adults in the Washington Post and University of Maryland survey said they support temporarily blocking nearly an immigration into the United States during the coronavirus outbreak. 34% oppose the idea. By pausing immigration will help but put unemployed Americans first in the line of jobs as America reopens, Trump previously said. It would be wrong and unjust for Americans laid off by the virus to re be replaced by a new immigrant labor flown in from abroad. The new Trump policy suspends new immigrant visas for 60 days. Exceptions will be made for medical and other essential workers, spouses and minor children of American citizens and other areas according to a White House release. Mass migration of low skilled labor into the United States disproportionately harms historically disadvantaged Americans, the release said. The polls reflects results from a USA Today poll in April in which 79% of Americans said they supported a temporary pause on all immigration significantly. The USA Today survey showed that the Americans back a policy even stricter than what Trump announced. Could a simple drug that's been on the market for decades successfully treat COVID-19? An Israeli research team believes so because of a significant breakthrough in understanding how the coronavirus reproduces in the lungs. Pro Professor Yankov, NAMIAS Director of Alexander Grass Center for Bioengineering at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and his research team has discovered how a drug on the market since 1975 could combat the pandemic. Viruses are parasites. They can't replicate on their own. They're essentially a, a box of protein with a single strand of genetic material inside, he told CBN News. In order to make more viruses, you have to get inside human cells. After three months of intense research, Namias, who is working together with Dr. Benjamin Teneva at New York's Mount Sinai Medical Center, saw how the virus prevents the routine burning of carbohydrates in the lungs, causing fat to accumulate. We found together with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York is the fact that once it gets into the cells, it starts making the cells make new fat, he explained. That was the key. Once we found that out, we could start screening drugs that may potentially block the virus, not by targeting the virus itself, but by going after fat accumulations, said Namias. So the virus needs this fat to grow and make new viruses, but a drug like phenofibrates can help the cells burn this fat and then suddenly virus production stops. Here's a recap of today's news. Pakistani Christian family beaten for saving 13 year old daughter from kidnapping by Muslim extremists. Protests still turning violent nationwide as White House ponders deploying more federal agents. Israeli scientists identified drug they hope can downgrade COVID-19 to common cold level. Today's news was reported by CBN, The Christian Post, 
Christian headlines, and Charisma News. My name is Russell, and this is Kingdom News. Until next time, have a good evening.